So without further ado, the first speaker today is uh, Professor Peter Bayless from uh, the neighborhood from Stanford University. He uh, joined Stanford uh, from Berkeley um, uh, and MIT, right? You were postdoc in at MIT. Yeah. PhD at Berkeley, postdoc in at MIT. He joined Stanford last year and uh, is a rising star in the, in the area of database uh, applied ma machine learning, large scale machine learning. And uh, today he's gonna share with us his, his recent work, which uh, I've seen once, but not enough. It's really exciting. I, I love what they're doing. So welcome, Peter. Great, thanks. Uh, it, it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you all for showing up and for the uh, untold number of you on GVC uh, as well. Um, uh, and thanks for that wonderful intro, Feifei. Uh, really excited uh, uh, for this opportunity to come speak with you. Um, so I'm a new faculty member uh, at Stanford. Um, and with some new faces on campus, uh, we've actually started a, a, a large-scale initiative we call Dawn, uh, of which this macro-based project is a, is a subcomponent, uh, geared around infrastructure and tools for uh, large-scale uh, machine learning and AI. So, so I'm coming here uh, under the guise of the Stanford Dawn project, data analytics for what ne what's next. It's myself. I study largely stream processing data management. Uh, my colleague Chris Ray, a certified genius by the MacArthur Foundation, studies database and machine learning. Um, and on the uh, bottom half, we actually have uh, some systems and architecture folks. So Kunle Olokoten uh, built some of the first multi-core chips with the Sun Niagara. And Matei Zaharia, uh, you may be familiar with, as the co-creator of Spark and Mesos. Um, so essentially in this Dawn project, uh, we're interested in uh, what's, a, what's a fairly exciting set of advances uh, in data today. And that we've seen these really wonderful breakthroughs and amazing breakthroughs in conventionally difficult tasks spanning image recognition, NLP, planning, information retrieval. And we're starting to see both in the private sector and the public sector, um, really society scale impact. Uh, things like autonomous vehicles are now becoming a reality. Uh, some of our work on personalized medicine shows that we can beat you know, Stanford uh, doctors at their own game with enough training data. Um, and some of Chris's work has even been used to make arrests and, and commonly uh, sort of in some really challenging tasks like uh, combating human trafficking. So, so you know, I come today with a message of optimism that I think we all share in this room, which is that there's no end in sight for advanced machine learning. Uh, but also with a recognition that this is a bit of a, uh, uh, of a fairy tale, right? Uh, there's a bit of an asterisk next to this golden era of data in that it's really the golden era of data for the best funded and best trained engineering teams, right? So even within an organization like Google, you know, AI and ML capabilities remain a fairly scarce commodity whereby to build a world-class production quality data product requires a team of tens to hundreds of data engineers, data scientists, um, machine learning researchers, and ultimately ops people to put these things into prod. So our goal in this five-year Dawn project is to enable anyone with domain expertise to build their own production quality machine learning projects, uh, products without requiring that PhD in machine learning or hiring our uh, wonderful students, uh, without becoming an expert in databases and systems, and without understanding the latest hardware to do so at scale and to run these models in a cost-effective manner, right? And the reason why we think this is feasible is for two reasons, okay? The first reason for why, we th why we're so excited about this is that you know, if we look to you all, right, or some of your colleagues here at Google, um, in one of our favorite papers from the last several years, Hidden Technical Debt Machine Learning Systems, first of all, only a fraction of real world machine learning systems are actually composed of machine learning code, right? That is, there's a large amount of work that goes into building predictive data products that, that goes beyond just you know, scribbling equations on a whiteboard or coming up with a new loss function and a new neural network architecture, right? It's about uh, configuration and data collection and then all the way to serve and monitoring, and there's these missing pieces, like vast missing pieces in the machine learning uh, life cycle that are essentially not addressed by today's data management uh, infrastructure. And the second reason why we think that this question is actually tractable um, is that you know, if we look to history, similar advances have actually happened before. Right? Uh, my favorite example of this is the building we're, we're in today. Right? So search is a great example of uh, sort of core technology being democratized through both better systems and better interfaces. So the core algorithms uh, before PageRank, things like TF-IDF and inverted indices and distributed query processing date back as early as the 1950s, right? So TF-IDF indices are from the literally 1950s from IBM. 
Uh, and what it took was sort of concerted effort by a large number of folks, including the folks in this organization, but also a lot of folks in the developer community, to make it so that today, we can add search to any application simply by linking a library like Slowly Lucene and essentially getting search that kind of works, or in most cases, works relatively well, sort of out of the box. And perhaps more importantly, everyone, that is these non-expert users, you know, my, my siblings and my parents who, who have never heard of distributed query processing or an inverted index, they can make use of search technology like Google and voice assistants that enable search uh, without actually understanding the underlying concepts. And so what we're asking this Dawn project is why isn't machine learning the same way? Well, what we think is necessary and what we're placing our bet over the next five years is that we need to fill out the remainder of that stack, those tools required for building these production quality data products, going beyond just better models and better cost functions and loss functions to actually providing systems and tools that assess, assist in all layers and all stages of the machine learning lifecycle, uh, from left to right, from data acquisition and feature engineering, to model training and productionization, and then all the way from sort of new interfaces for non-expert non users, all the way down to new hardware that can exploit the statistical imprecision in these algorithms, do things like uh, relaxed coherency memory, in order to make sure we can run these sorts of algorithms uh, efficiently on modern hardware. So this is our vision and broadly where I'm coming to you today from. We think we have a huge opportunity to build systems and tools that make it radically easier and cheaper to build production quality data products. We're building up an open source stack as part of this Dawn project. In fact, we're very excited about the potential of having Google involved in our journey here. And there's a whole website online uh, you can take a look at to learn more about this stack that we're putting together. For this specific talk, I'm going to describe just one slice of this Dawn vision, which is a new system we're building called MacroBase, designed to make it easier to extract value and, perf and perform classification and aggregation tasks over large-scale telemetry streams. Okay? So I'm just going to zoom in, and we're going to give a deep dive into one narrow slice through the stack of work going on uh, at Stanford. And this is joint work with a large number of students uh, and faculty, both my PIs who occupy spaces below and, say, compilers and hardware, and also spaces above in terms of new interfaces, as well as a wonderful team of grad students who's actually you know, building out a large part of this, which is all available as open source. So I'd encourage you, I'll have links in the talk, to actually go and download systems like Snorkel and Weld, as well as Macrobase. Okay? So where are we coming from? Essentially, after the era of, of big data, right? Big data sort of convinced every CTO on the planet that data had value. We should store this stuff. And the cost of value went down precipitously. So instead of paying, say, $100,000 a terabyte for data, we can afford to store it for cents on the dollar in a, a, a commodity data warehouse like HDFS or S3 or you know, maybe Google um, BigQuery. <laughs> uh, and, and what we've seen is that there's you know, huge uh, a ramp up in the collection of, of streaming telemetry, largely driven by increases in automated data sources, right? So it becomes easier and cheaper than ever to instrument complex applications on the server, uh, on uh, mobile phones, and also tracking user behavior. We're generating huge amounts of logs, okay? So at least publicly, right, the public numbers we hear from our friends down the street, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, they're collecting over 12 million events per second. Um, I would be uh, shocked if the number wasn't higher uh, internally uh, at Google. And the sort of resulting challenge challenge here as these data volumes continue to rocket is that, you know, for you and I, um, you know, we're not getting any, any smarter, right? We're not getting any faster in picking up this data, right? So fundamentally, um, human attention is relatively scarce compared to these data volumes. And you know, our friends over beers will report that for their you know, observability platforms that are sucking in all of this telemetry from, say, mobile devices and servers and so on, less than 6% of this data is ever actually read, right? You might ask, well, why is this being stored? Well, it turns out that you know, when something goes wrong, you want to go back to the data and actually try to figure out what happened. But the question is, you know, can we do better in order to increase the amount of data that we're, that we're actually looking at in these, in these sort of live telemetry streams and decrease the time from sort of uh, event to detection and remediation? So motivating example of a, of a company we worked with very early on in this project, um, this was during some of my time at uh, MIT that Feifei mentioned, um, Cambridge Mobile Telematics is a spin-off from the MIT Cartel project. Uh, their product basically collects and analyzes telemetry in the form of driving behavior from end user devices. Um, so they sell an app that runs a predictive model and says, are you a good driver or not? And we'll give you actually sort of suggestions for um, how to improve your driving behavior. Okay. And the CMT application operators, who are, include you know, two MIT professors, Sam Madden and Haribal Christian, great guys, incredibly smart, want to answer a simple question, is the application behaving well on every platform? Well, 
if any of you work on Android, you won't be surprised that this is a difficult question to answer, right? So if we look at the Android device ecosystem, this is the de device ecosystem in 2015, uh, we see that there are over 24,000 different Android device types, and this number has doubled since 2013. Okay, so, so we have to understand, for instance, how our app is behaving on each and every one of these hardware platforms and also each and every one of our releases of our application in each and every one of the Android device releases, okay? So just do a little bit of like mental math. Um, if we were gonna try to analyze the 24,000 different device, uh, Android devices in the wild and just the 25 different Android API releases, just spending one second per combination here to check this, right, manually, would require seven continuous days of effort, okay? Now, this is clearly not going to work as we're releasing you know, new versions of our application every day um, or possibly multiple times a day. And it's actually important that we do inspect these things because in the rare combinations of, say, application version and, um, and, and um, hardware version where there is some problematic interaction, for instance, there's a buggy accelerometer or there's a problem with a connection, especially when people are building sort of Android SOCs for, um, you know, a couple cents or maybe tens of cents these days. Um, we want to understand if these things matter. And, and in fact, at CMT, we found, you know, for instance, uh, uh, one problem with us. Fortunately, not, a, not an Android problem. We found other Android problems. But uh, for, the, for the iOS problem, we found, you know, iOS 9.0 beta 1-5, but not 9.0.1 had a buggy Bluetooth stack that prevented these iOS devices from connecting to the in-car sensors, okay? So for a very small portion of the population that was running this particular um, thing, essentially one very small cell uh, in the deployment, in the deploy base for the CMT application, there was actually a significant uh, degraded sort of performance, right? So what we want to do broadly in this work with this macro-based engine is to enable us to take all of this sort of high-dimensional streaming telemetry and actually uh, automatically prioritize uh, end-user attention. And specifically, we're going to do so by combining a large number of, or a small number of highly powerful statistical operators for classification and aggregation that will enable us to pop out these sorts of combinations uh, automatically. Okay. So a little bit of a roadmap here for the remainder of the talk. Having motivated Dawn on the challenge of what we're calling this sort of fast data, more telemetry than you can stake a, shake a stick at, and certainly more telemetry than you ever want to look at manually on your own. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time describing you know, what's, missing, uh, <laughs> what's missing from streaming machine learning systems today. Right? Why do we need a new system like MacroBase? I'll describe our approach in the MacroBase engine to building end-to-end -end model cascades that are able to filter and aggregate the stream. And I'll spend most of my time at, towards the end describing sort of how putting these operators together in an end-to-end -end system can enable new optimizations that essentially aren't, uh, aren't possible or, or would never be sort of feasible um, if we just study the statistical uh, operators in isolation, right? So basically by putting things end-to-end, -end, we can suddenly optimize entire pipelines and that can give us orders of magnitude speedups. Uh, I'll discuss this in the form of uh, unsupervised density estimation and because everyone loves neural networks, I'll also talk about some work we've been doing on accelerating inference over uh, video streams, okay? So moving right along, what's missing with today's sort of streaming uh, ML systems? Well, you know, in theory, we have really wonderful infrastructure, right? It's 2017, we can pat ourselves on the back, that we have a large number of choices for um, deploying sort of functions on streams, right? So one of my favorite articles from the last uh, uh, year is this uh, article, All the Apache Streaming Projects and Exploratory Guides. So there are over 20 different uh, uh, data flow engines in the Apache Software Foundation alone that we can run and download, including uh, one of my favorites from, from you all, uh, the, the, the Beam project, right? Um, so this is really great. We can basically run a function over a bunch of streams on a bunch of servers. So we kind of have half of the equation required to be able to sort of winnow down these streams. Uh, the problem here is that uh, the stream processing engines aren't exactly batteries included for a lot of these tasks. As I mentioned in, in the Dawn question we're trying to address, there's a lot of work that goes into actually building production quality data pipelines and uh, machine learning products. And so today, if we wanted to say query for outlying device readings in a data stream, right, in a telemetry stream using Apache Spark, you know, we, we sort of asked the Apache Spark creators, including Matei, you know, Spark would say, well, you know, sure we can do that. Just write your own user-defined function for kernel density estimation. You know, read a textbook, implement kernel density estimation, and, and you're fine. 
And what we find, uh, you know, by and large, is that although this is a valid answer, uh, the actual implementation of these statistical operators at scale remains a uh, rarely completed uh, exercise for the end user, right? What we essentially see is people, by and large, um, have these stream processing engines, but ultimately rely on fairly brittle, but relatively fast to execute sort of static rules instead. So a lot of the goodness we could get from stats uh, essentially remains uh, in the textbooks, OK? So we got a lot of data flow engines. You just got to implement their own functionality. You can't just do the stuff with a, with, a, with a join or a select or project operator. There's a lot of stuff from statistics, but it's unclear you know, what we should deploy and how we can compose and combine these things into uh, an end-to-end -end engine. So you sort of need a really rare combination of uh, disciplines in order to be able to build these types of, 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 of pipelines today. You need not just that domain expertise to know, hey, you know, I'm an application builder. Um, I know what my iOS application, you know, what normal activity looks like. But I also need to know, you know statistics and machine learning, and I need to know how to write a bunch of Spark code, which essentially, um, in our experience, does not really exist in any one org. Or if it does, it's, it's going to be you know, the highest value organizations uh, within so, sort of the most uh, impressive companies uh, like Google. Okay? So we're going to make it easier to do this. And to do so, we're building essentially a new stream processing engine specifically designed to accelerate these sort of streaming ML workloads. And, and here's where I'm going to start to drop down an abstraction to, to, to give you a little bit of uh, insight into what we're actually doing uh, under the hood here. So, the core questions we're asking in Macrobase, this is part of Dawn, so it's a five-year uh, project. Incidentally, you know, five years corresponds to the end of my tenure clock, so it's a good um, sort of uh, timeline there. Um, so I'm betting pretty big on these questions. Um, so we, the first thing we want to know is, you know, what should we actually run in this operator, er, in, in this engine, right? So, so we knew from like SQL, data warehouses, select, project, join are really useful. We can, we can kind of string these operators together um, to build some pretty cool and interesting applications, right? Um, we can do business analytics. We can do customer segmentation and so on. So what's the analog of these operators for this type of sort of fast data analysis, where if I gave you like a data cube operator of these streams, you'd have way too many results, right? So what should we run instead? And then the second question is, you know, how can we use techniques from sort of conventional database systems and, and sort of large scale data processing engines in the design of these operators that can actually achieve the scale we need to get up to, say, millions of events per second, OK? So those are the sort of two questions we're grappling with in this project. Um, towards the first question of semantics, uh, the way that Macrobase works is we actually combine uh, 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 three core operators, OK? So we essentially execute cascades of statistical operators that sort of transform, filter, and aggregate the stream. So just for a show of hands, I realize I can't see people on the GVC, but who here is sort of um, uh, familiar with, say, statistical classification or unsupervised classification? OK, so maybe, maybe half, which is great. OK, so I'll give kind of the, a higher level overview and then a lower level overview, right? Um, so the way to think about how we're going to process these streams, and I'll illustrate this through a demo, um, is that we're going to, first of all, uh, take in these data streams and, and using sort of domain-specific information. This could be a neural network. This could be a set of rules or transformation functions. We're going to extract the features we're looking for from the stream. So if we're looking for, say, um, oscillations in a time series, we'll employ a, 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 a sort of feature transformation operator that will pick out and record over the last say, five minutes of the stream uh, where the oscillations lie. We'll subsequently apply what's called classification or statistical classification to segment the stream into examples often of good behavior and bad behavior. For instance, say, this is our, these are abnormally high oscillations or abnormally low oscillations. And finally, instead of simply reporting all of the raw streams of the user, let's say we're getting 10, 000, 10 million events per second, we don't want to report 10 million points to the end user. We're going to roll these things up by essentially aggregating them to give uh, results like readings from Android Galaxy S5 devices running application version 52 are 30 times more likely than others to have abnormally high frequency. Okay? So I'll illustrate this through a, through a quick example. Um, as I mentioned, Macrobase is a stream processing engine. Uh, so it's essentially a... Um, a data flow engine, kind of like Spark or, um, or Storm or Beam. But we've also, using this data flow engine, essentially uh, built a couple front ends on top of it. Okay? So, so what I'm demonstrating here is a front end we've built. It's just a simple REST server that's going to call the core stream processing operators. Um, that will essentially enable us to run over historical data. Right? So you can think of this is kind of exploratory console that's going to exercise the core um, uh, cascade functionality uh, that I described earlier. So what does this look like? I've got a Postgres server running on my local machine. Um, it's got a bunch of data from mobile devices. This is uh, 
simple or similar to what we saw with the CMT data. And if we just look at a sample of this, uh, for instance, from the um, uh, database, this is what we might look at if we did a select, it's actually running a select star and dumping the results um, on, uh, in the UI, right? So we got a bunch of records from given users and state, make, model, firmware version, app version, and we have some metrics like temperature, battery drain, trip time, okay? So you know, if you and I have, say, a SQL database or we have something like Tableau or a BI tool, this is probably what we're working with, right? And maybe we can identify some rows as having, say, high trip time or high battery drain. Um, there's a lot of rows in this table in particular. So um, actually, if we scrolled through all of these, we'd probably hear, be here till um, sometime tomorrow. Um, and and it, the, you know, the challenge here is, first of all, identifying you know, which of these rows is abnormal compared to the population. And second of all, when we have this sort of proliferation of make and model and so on, it's going to take us a long time to sort of piece together, are there significant behaviors going on in the stream? So to, to give an example of this type of functionality we're supporting in Macrobase, um, what we've enabled is basically automating a process that a lot of people do today when something goes wrong. So let's say, we, let's say we, our key performance indicator here is battery drain. So we care about, say, abnormally high battery drain. Um, Macrobase can automatically apply uh, unsupervised density estimation. So here I'm just going to apply a robust estimator of you know, basically MAD here, if you're familiar with this. But I'm going to find the weirdest battery points with battery drain in the stream. Instead of reporting all of these individual points, uh, Macrobase will do a roll-up according to particular attributes that I'm looking for. So, so I can say, find me uh, a ap application version and make and model uh, that, that are unduly or highly correlated with, with, with extreme battery drain. Okay? So basically, I've done some really simple feature selection here, uh, ex expressing a metric of interest and some attributes that I like to sort of roll up by. This specifies a query. And by kicking analyze, I actually kick off the stream processor under the hood. Right? So this basically, uh, in this little, little bit less than a second, uh, sort of sucked in about 100,000 rows from the Postgres database and uh, applied classifier and an aggregation function and spit out a result uh, as follows. So this combination of application version, hardware make, and hardware model um, was uh, 472 times more likely to result in uh, abnormally high battery drain than the overall population, okay? which seems somewhat problematic. There are 849 records that match this particular filter. And if we look at the actual plot of these battery drain readings, the overall distribution of the population is here in blue. And this particular subgroup, right, identified by this sort of conjunct of app version, harder make, and harder model, has a distribution that's significantly different than the overall population, which indicates there's something possibly going on with this particular uh, uh, a subgroup. And we can go in and we can drill in this exact data, or we can generate a SQL query to dump this into a um, uh, you know, a downstream uh, engine like Tableau in order to drill deeper, or we can just go and get the CSV and go play with this thing in Pandas, okay? But the idea here is that essentially by highlighting a small number of target metrics and, and explanatory attributes, we can sort of sift through these very large data volumes and actually get out a much smaller set of explanations or summaries that describe the most unusual or abnormal behavior, okay? So you can think of this as sort of um, doing what, similar to what, uh, uh, from the sort of user's perspective, this is sort of similar to what people do in, in root cause analysis, right? You want to find out, okay, some alarm went off, what's common, among, what distinguishes the things that are you know, firing alerts versus things that are not, right? Here we're just automating that process. From the ML side of the house, we're applying unsupervised density estimation uh, here in a univariate setting, and we're applying essentially um, combinatorial uh, feature selection routines over the explanatory attributes in order to pull out these high-level summaries that a non-expert user can go and sort of dig into. Another sort of cool part of the, about this, about doing this in a unified engine is, I said we're kind of running a streaming query under the hood, right? So when I actually run this through the UI, I also get a config file which can then be used as a seed in a streaming job. So you can basically take the output of the exploratory UI. We can basically uh, get the config. Like we say, I like that result. Please keep it up to date. And we can now run a stream processing job that will continually ingest the data and we'll keep this thing up to date. Okay? So um, benefits of having sort of a unified uh, uh, system here. All right. So. Great. So what are we doing? Um, under the hood, right? So um, we're applying this transformation rule. Um, in the case of the, of, the, of the relational data I showed, we're basically just you know, having users select 
uh, columns, like subsets of columns, uh, for use in downstream analytics. Uh, I'll show some examples of images and videos later, but for instance, uh, if you want to do so, we did, we did a test with satellite imagery, where you know, clearly you don't want to look for abnormal pixels, but you can extract you know, domain-specific features like hue and luminosity. So we were able to pick out, you know, the bit, using time-varying satellite imagery, you know, if we look at year-over-year uh, -year differences in uh, hue, right, you can pick out things like um, uh, the Bay Area was in a drought in, in 20, was it 2014 here, right? Um, this is pretty straightforward. For time series, right, if we don't want to just feed in each point as it comes in, we can run sort of an FFT or, or segment the stream into, into windows, okay? Um, then we sort of apply, once we have these sort of data points that, that specify what we're looking for in terms of KPIs or abnormal behavior, we apply a classifier, right? So our default behavior, because most users don't have labels for a lot of their streams, uh, we apply what's known as sort of unsupervised density estimation. So we essentially, over the stream, um, learn what the distribution of, of data points looks like um, and essentially find points in the tail. So we measure you know, basically a, a mean and standard deviation and then find things that are fairly far away from the mean. Um, this is a bit of a cartoon picture and that, you know, in practice some of our distributions look much stranger, right? So we'll use something like a kernel density estimator. But the basic idea here is that, you know, with relatively simple classifiers that have no information about the sort of um, labels, we can actually pick out these sort of abnormal uh, events. Um, and finally, instead of simply returning all of these points that we think are sort of uh, anomalous or unusual and asking users, hey, figure this out for us, right? And this is actually pretty important, right? It's really a pain to actually go in and say, is there something going on with HCC devices? Is there something going on TCT devices? Are there combinations here? Right? Humans are terrible at combinations. Uh, nothing wrong with us, but we should let our you know, you know, you know, robot overlords do the work for us. Um, Macrobase essentially lets us you know, roll up these streams. So if we get a, a stream of, say, errors and non-errors, um, that looks like this, we can ask, you know, what makes the errors different than the non-errors? So this is sort of like running lasso over the um, uh, two classes. But, but, the, but the basic sort of interpretation of this is we say, what, what, what makes these two different, right? So if we look and we say, well, iPhone 6 occurs three times in the errors, and it occurs one, two, three, four, it occurs many times in the non-errors, uh, maybe not that interesting. Um, if we look at Canada, uh, we see it occurs three times in the errors and doesn't occur at all in the non-errors. So we could say, you know, looks like Canada may have a problem, right? And we can sort of use this measure of co-occurrence or this risk ratio as a measure of uh, severity, right? Where we can say, okay, this is the most severe uh, 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 sort of combination of attributes that causes problematic behavior. Um, so, so what we're doing is we're getting away from results that look like this, right, in tabular form, and we're getting to uh, uh, results that look like this, where we're highlighting correlated attributes and uh, also sort of, you know, differences in distribution. So user select their key performance metric metrics, their explanatory attributes. We classify uh, metrics and points that behave that belong in the tails. And then we uh, generate sort of classifications, or, or sorry, we generate explanations using these attributes by doing sort of hypothesis testing. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, one of the things I'll point out that's kind of interesting here, um, we've, we've essentially combined three different operators. This is a different view of the same pipeline I showed before. Uh, transformation, classification, explanation. And we found that by changing the transformation function, also change the inputs to each stage, uh, we can actually do quite a bit with, this, with these three operators, right? Um, so, you know, in terms of production uses, I mentioned this is all sort of um, open source and publicly available. Um, you can use it a couple different ways. You can use the UI, as I showed in the demo. Uh, you can use our pre-built sort of uh, pipelines where we combine uh, these things into sort of uh, recipes for you. Or you can just take the individual operators, like our um, fast uh, explanation operators, and plug them into existing stream processing engines. So, so we've, we've sort of found people using this, this technology, it's all available on GitHub, um, for different things. So, so, so in automotives, uh, one of these uh, engineers who works with on, on electric car batteries looked at the fleet telemetry and uh, just, just used the UI in order to augment their existing SQL queries for their you know, daily reporting in order to identify a, a problematic interaction between a new firmware version and a subset of the vehicle make and models that were in the fleet. Okay? So this was kind of like a, a cubing on steroids style approach. Um, in online services, uh, we're actually running this, uh, or we, we run this to identify slow containers. Okay, so this is like, you know, you have a, imagine you have a process that's spitting out huge amounts of telemetry, and you want to know, 
does landing on a given container uh, in my data center make me more or less likely to be considered an outlier for my job? Okay. Um, we've used this industrial manufacturing. Maybe the most interesting one, coming back to our mobile application setting, is um, you know if, if you have, say, um, exception data coming back from an application, right? So um, in, in one scenario, we have someone who's running an application uh, live on um, at least a couple million devices. Um, whenever they get an exception, they want to know, you know, is there something you know, correlated going on, right? So let's say they try to open an asset in their mobile application, the asset fails to load. Is it a problem with the user? Is it a problem with the user's ISP? Is it a problem with the, the cache server the asset is located on? Is it a problem with the uh, uh, hardware make, hardware model, application version, and so on? So we essentially do automated rollups uh, for them using this explanation operator. And for these guys, it's pretty interesting. They don't even use the first half of the stack, right? They already have a um, stream processing engine set up. It's all JVM based, so they can, they can basically take their stream of exceptions, they run them through the macro base operator, for explanation, which does the aggregation. And if there's a correlation in the stream that's of particular severity, let's say this app version and this, this hardware make uh, provide, say, um, three times or five times higher than usual exception rates, someone gets paged. Okay. So um, pretty cool. Love open source. Like I said, all the stuff we're doing is open source. It's a great way to get sort of feedback on these types of tasks. And you know, at CMT, which is one I can talk about in particularly public, um, you know, we were able to find some pretty crazy device-specific battery problems and an issue with the application um, on startup that were basically you know, unknown to these users. Okay? So we think this is a really cool sort of combination of uh, statistical operators, where today you'd have to implement all of this yourself. And what we found is that you know, for these non-expert users who are really fantastic, like they know everything about their mobile application, they know everything about their sort of data center deployment, or know everything about um, say automotives, uh, you know, they don't have the background or the time to go and build up this streaming infrastructure. So, so providing sort of batteries included um, you know, UIs or pipelines or even the ability to deploy new custom data flow operators, it's actually a fairly useful um, uh, piece of software. And of course, on the research side, like I said, I got to get tenure. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're able to do under the hood when we put these operators together that are really not possible uh, in isolation, right? So we're able to speed up conventionally uh, 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 highly optimized operators for, say, classification by taking advantage of the fact that we're not running over, say, arbitrary data points, but that we're running over a particular user stream with a particular set of uh, properties. So I'm going to give kind of three examples of this type of optimization um, that I think are, are, are particularly exciting. So this brings us from the semantic side uh, down to the implementation. So how can we use techniques from systems in order to um, sort of speed up the, the execution of, this, of these types of operators? And the cool part, or the thing I'm most excited about, right, and the students are like just, you know, not only crushing a bunch of papers, pushing a bunch of papers out, but they're also sort of finding that these things can really lead to quanti qualitatively different user experiences, um, is that by bringing these together, we get new sort of opportunities for end-to-end for -end optimization. I'll just give you sort of three quick examples. Um, and then we're going to get to the neural networks as the third example, okay? So as promised, uh, you thought you knew everything about um, model distillation. Turns out you can go even faster, okay? All right, there's a teaser for those of you ML nerds in the audience, okay? So simple warm-up, okay? This one's, this one's pretty cool. So let's say we want to do this explanation thing in, in macrobase. We want to say, what makes the good stuff different from the bad stuff? Let's say we have a bunch of ba uh, bad stuff in red and a bunch of good stuff in green. The green stuff probably goes all the way down you know, the center of the core, because there's a lot more good stuff going on in applications than bad stuff, right? If your application's on fire, you probably know about it, okay? Um, so, so, so what's sort of the canonical way that we go about doing this? Well, we're sort of trying to look at what are highly correlated members of each, of each class here. So what makes the red a red and what makes the green a green? Okay. So in this setting, you know, we could very easily sort of compute correlations within each class independently, right? So we could go over the red and say A occurs 80% of the time, B occurs 20% of the time. We could go over all the greens and say, okay, the, the A's occur 0.1% of the time, uh, B's occur 46% of the time, and so on. Okay? Um, this would work, uh, but it's going to be fairly expensive because if we want to compute not just individual element correlations, we want to compute pairwise or order three or order four combinations. How often does A, B, C, D occur? How often does A, B, E occur? You know, all of these sort of um, rare sort of combinations that may in fact be correlated with a bug, this can be really, really slow. Okay? So, you know, think about this for a second. You know, how can we go faster than simply running some sort of correlation, you know, mining or detection procedure over each individual? Well, the answer is a little bit, you know, it, it, it's sort of uh, uh, implied on the slide. Note there's not that many red things. 
Yeah? There's not much on the left. And so what we found is that if we exploit this sort of what we call in a conventional database engine, the cardinality imbalance between these classes, we can go much faster. It's almost like when you're running a join. If you want to join A with B, and A is much, 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 much smaller than B, you start by building a hash table on A, and then you only go and touch the parts of B that you actually need to go look for, right? So we do the same thing in macrobase. We first detect sort of meaningful correlations in the red class, and only once, we've once we come up with a candidate set of correlations for elements that are highly correlated like A, then we go and actually touch the, the green stuff, the, the inliers. Right? So basically, um, we can avoid processing you know, the Bs and the Cs and the Ds, and also avoid processing you know, higher order combinations of these things without actually the full expense um, of doing this naively. So by knowing the fact that one stream is much bigger than the other, we can go much, much faster. And, and you, know, you can read the papers if you want to see this, but you know, it's like orders of magnitude faster. Uh, it's like you know, two orders of magnitude faster than running a decision tree, and three orders of magnitude faster than doing a lot of other stuff, like building a data cube over your data here. Okay? Um, one of the cool things here from the stats side that I geek out about, um, you know, when we're testing all of these hypotheses, right, um, you might wonder, are you going to get false discoveries, right? So in medicine, we sort of freak out. Most medical studies are false because people, okay, so let's say you're a grad student, you finish five years of, of work on a clinical trial, and you find out, ugh, you know, bubble gum doesn't cause cancer. <laughs> Shoot, uh, what am I going to do? I have a negative result. No one likes negative results in science. So if you're a grad student with your N equals 30 cohort, you're going to say, well, I wonder if anyone ate celery. Oh, no, celery's not correlated. I wonder if anyone ate carrots. Oh, carrots aren't correlated. Artichoke. Oh, artichokes. I found a significant correlation between artichokes and cancer in my population of size 30. Right? So if you test enough hypotheses, just like the birthday paradox, you're going to get some false discoveries. Okay? So essentially, in a conventional statistical setting, you have this problem where with limited sample size, you can only afford to test a, a, a limited number of hypotheses, like these explanations we're generating, without getting, due to random chance, something going wrong. In the macro-based setting, right, with all this fast data coming in, we have the opposite problem. Our problem is not that we are going to run out of some statistical budget uh, by testing too many hypotheses. Our problem is that we have so many uh, hypothesis, or sorry, we have so much data coming in, we need to use our limited computational budget as intelligently as possible, right? So by essentially being able to scale up and process, say, 500,000 uh, events per second on a single core, as we can with this optimized explanation operator, we can afford to test many, many, many more possible hypotheses without compromising statistical validity. That is, with simple corrections, so if you're a stats nerd, if you're, it was simple corrections like the Bonferroni correction, right, at 500,000 samples and a 1% sort of baseline um, uh, 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 exception rate, you can afford to uh, test many, many, many different, many more hypotheses than you could with a sample size of, say, 30, okay? So, so sort of surprising result. Um, this was one example uh, of how we can sort of exploit this end-to-end -end, uh, process. Note that if we didn't have this classify operator, and we're just trying to explain arbitrary, sub arbitrary groups, we wouldn't have this cardinality imbalance. But because we know we're looking for sort of rare events and many pipelines, we can actually exploit this aggressively to improve both result quality and scalability. Right? So in, and to be, to be clear, like three orders of magnitude is the difference between you know, waiting for the result um, you know, all day versus being able to get that interactive response in a browser. So this does qualitatively change uh, one, the, the sort of exploratory user experience, but also the ability to alert in real time. Okay? So it's a pretty big deal, despite a simple trick. Um, moving up the pipeline, uh, we've been looking a lot at, at classification as well and how we can make this faster for more complex distributions. So I'll give another quick example. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we sometimes have distributions look like this. This is a distribution from uh, the uh, UCI data set, uh, or UCI repository. It's temperature and carbon dioxide um, in a, uh, a building. And you might ask, well, how would I model this? How do I find the data in the tails for this particular distribution? And uh, if we apply something like a simple Gaussian, uh, we're not going to fit this fine-grained structure particularly well, right? Um, it turns out that each of the white dots, if you can see them on the screen, corresponds to a, a location or a time in which someone was in the room. Okay, so the outliers actually are statistically, well, at least correlated with, with um, uh, human activity. Um, but we're not going to pick that up at all if we use a simple but easy to compute model like a Gaussian I showed earlier. If we do something like a Gaussian mixture model, right, and say pull out 10 different Gaussians and plop them in space, we sort of start to resolve this finer grain structure a little bit better, but it's still pretty ugly, right? It's not really um, uh, you know, capturing all of this sort of structure um, out in this tail and so on. And we actually get pretty bad classification accuracy uh, if, we, if we rely on this simple model. 
So what we want is kind of the granddaddy of all unsupervised density estimators, uh, which is this thing that looks like this. It's called the kernel density estimator, where we can basically get a really nice heat map um, of, the, of the distribution uh, by essentially performing the following step. For each data point in our data set, we kind of drop a Gaussian on top of it, right? And if we want to query the density of the data set at any given point, like let's say right here, we sum up the contribution from all of the individual Gaussians in our data set. Okay, so it's like every single point contributes a little bit, like a little bump to the overall estimate. And this is wonderful because it's you know, provably asymptotically optimal, um, and we can essentially approximate for, you know, under very mild conditions, essentially any distribution we're going to encounter in practice. Uh, the problem here is that this is actually an O of n squared operation, right? To compute the exact density of each of these you know, points on the curve requires, uh, for a 500,000 point data set, two hours on a 2.4 gigahertz CPU. So this thing's clearly not going to scale. As I mentioned, by essentially optimizing end-to-end -end here, by taking advantage of the fact that we're running over a full pipeline, uh, we can do considerably better. And so we asked, how can we take advantage of the fact that we're looking for um, uh, data in the tails to basically run faster? And the answer is, we can essentially apply yet another favorite technique of mine from database systems to essentially prune computation. So the idea is that if we're just trying to identify uh, whether or not a point is abo above or below some, some cutoff, to say, is this a rare point or not, we don't need to waste our time computing density estimates for all of the stuff above the threshold. Illustrated graphically, if we've got a distribution like this, uh, we don't need to compute the exact color reading for each of these parts in blue. We just need to compute, are we in the blue set or out of the blue set? And so we showed in a recent Sigmod paper that by essentially uh, uh, computing exact estimates or bounds on densities, as opposed to the exact densities, we can take this kernel density estimator, which takes two hours to run on a 2.4 gigahertz CPU, and speed up by almost three orders of magnitude, simply by recognizing that in the downstream analytics task, we only want to compute above or below. And so now this brings us KDE from the realm of sort of nice to have statistically, but way too slow to run empirically, to nice to have statistically and fast enough to run over, over real data sets. All right. One final example before I conclude, and I think this might be pretty exciting for some of the folks who are working on video and, and image processing here. Um, we've recently been interested in asking how far can we, can we take uh, these ideas and apply them to other domains beyond just streaming telemetry from, say, devices? What if we have richer data types like uh, images and videos? So we have a project, uh, it'll appear in VLDB shortly, called NoScope, um, and we essentially said, there are a large number of these neural networks you can run to basically feed in, uh, say, webcam feeds like the one I'm depicting here, and essentially extract um, you know, occurrences of objects in the world. So here we're detecting a bus and some people, and uh, you know, if we smooth the labels well enough, the sort of state of the art uh, does pretty well at actually extracting you know, reasonable features that we could use in a downstream analytics task. So for instance, we could ask, at what times was traffic heaviest at this intersection in Taipei? Okay. Now, the problem here is that uh, the state-of-the-art neural networks run about 30 frames per second on a $1,000 GPU, okay? And that's going to be incredibly expensive if we want to monitor large numbers of, of data streams. Specifically, you know, tagging images with these deep nets doesn't scale. The popular models that, that, that are sort of uh, available are trained on still images. So, you know, work like Feifei's ImageNet that was fantastic in letting people increase the, the, the quality of their neural networks is only, you know, labeled frames. Right? It's a you know, bunch of uh, individual images. And so if we want to run this on video, we essentially treat this video as a sequence of images and run it one, 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 one image after the other. And so as I mentioned, for YOLO V2, which is one of the fastest models on a P100, which is an $8,000 GPU, it's 80 frames per second. On a Titan X GPU, which is about $1,200, maybe a little cheaper now, it's 50 frames per second. So for a, 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 you know, a thousand cameras, just in GPU costs alone, it's about a million dollars. So we want to know, you know, how can we do better here? It might be cheaper with TPUs, okay? So we can talk about that. But, um, but it, it's definitely expensive. So we said, how can we do better? And I'll just leave you with, with one idea here. Um, if we have a query like this, I want to know when buses pass by an intersection in Taipei using YOLO v2. So run YOLO v2 over, you know, possibly historical data from this, from this uh, scene, alternatively live as, as data feeds arrive. Well, YOLO v2 is amazing because it can pick out these buses. The problem is it's, it's you know, also good at picking out a lot of other stuff. 
So, you know, YOLO V2 can detect things like toilets and cats and skis. These are literal examples from the training data uh, uh, that YOLO is used to um, identify. And moreover, you know, even for things like buses here, there's a bus here, there's a bus here. Because we're looking at this particular video feed, we don't necessarily care about uh, 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 sort of different uh, orientations, right? What I want to know is, again, I want to know when buses pass by this intersection, right, uh, in, in Taipei, right? Uh, so I have a fixed angle and a fixed class. And the buses are fairly similar from this video feed, right? I mean, these are five different buses, and they all look relatively, relatively similar. So the idea is that we can essentially exploit this observation by training uh, just-in-time sort of specialized neural networks where we train the big CNN over the, over the uh, stream of interest in order to generate a large amount of training data. So we run that in real time. And then we train a surrogate model or a specialized CNN uh, that can run much faster. Okay, so if YOLO v2 runs on 80 frames per second, we can use a much smaller network that achieves the same accuracy as YOLO, uh, but runs at 15,000 frames per second. Okay. And the key idea here, compared to things like model distillation, is that we're throwing away the generality of the parent network. Right? This network that we learn, the specialized network, will not run accurately on anything but the webcam that we've trained it on. And it also won't run on anything but buses, right? We're extending this to multi-class and counting and so on. But really, it's, 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 it's taking this incredibly powerful network and saying, what if I want to squeeze this down to the minimum network size required for a particular query? So it's like lossy compression, where we can't tell the difference between the original and the, um, and the, uh, the, the new model. Um, so this is pretty cool. And by cascading these models, in the interest of time, I'll skip over how we handle differences in, um, in time. Instead of feeding the video directly to YOLO v2, we cascade uh, a thing that tells us if something changed, these specialized models with YOLO v2, and we avoid running YOLO v2 as much as possible. So when we run this on things like looking for buses in Taipei, or cars in Amsterdam, or uh, cars in Jackson Hole, a bunch of stuff you can find in the paper, we find that we can get speed ups um, you know, depending on the accuracy level that you'd like to maintain compared to YOLO v2 um, of up to you know, 10,000 x. So if you want a 1% loss in accuracy, you can you know, often get a 100 x speed up just for free um, by training a specialized model and, and not calling YOLO v2 as much. And then if you're willing to go really, really fast or you can't afford to run over a, uh, you can't afford to run YOLO over all this uh, historical data, um, you can sacrifice even more. So sort of our, our, our thought here is that instead of just obsessing over 99.5% you know, accuracy and going a little bit lower, we can train a much specialized model for a given task at hand and actually achieve dramatic speed ups that actually make these type of large scale video analytics actually feasible at scale. So uh, those were three examples of how we can use techniques from systems, the design of sort of efficient operators uh, for online training and inference. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just leave you with, with a couple uh, uh, things to think about. Um, Macrobase, as I said, is, is, is sort of a new open source engine, lots of projects going on inside of here around making it easier to make use of and derive value from online streaming uh, uh, data sources. And it's been really exciting to see what the open source community has done with this. And I'd love to talk with you all about possible uh, use cases and extensions for this. Uh, and we, we spent a lot of time talking to developers and engineers um, actually validating the stuff in the field. So that actually really drives the whole of Dawn. Uh, uh, our, our sort of strategy is, is really informed by current use cases, uh, both on campus and off campus, in sort of high volume, uh, uh, high value uh, machine learning pipelines. Uh, there's a ton of uh, work on Macrobase. You can find it on my website. Uh, I think two of these are now in, in VLDB if you're interested. Um, and the, the, the message I come to you with uh, in conclusion is very optimistic. We have a lot more data than we know what to do with. We can do a lot of cool stuff with systems in order to make this data useful. Thanks for your time. So for speeding up YOLO that work, um, did you care what kind of error, if you're willing to be faster and sacrifice uh, performance a little bit, did you, can you elaborate on, do you get more recall or the precision, what type of error? It's a great, yeah, so good question. So um, two things about our current experiment. So right now we set a, you can, we have, so, okay. We basically let users specify a false positive, false negative rate. And currently I think we're doing 50-50 split on, on both. So I think this is like, you know, I say 1% would be 50% or 0.5% false positive, 0.5% false negative. Um, 
but uh, it, we like the code that we have basically in the opt this optimizer we have lets you basically tune those parameters. So certainly if I if I have like no buses in the scene and I allow 100%, you know false negative rate, then I'm fine, but, but it's kind of configurable. Uh, so I think the, what I, the results I presented were from 50-50. Um, one thing I'll also point out compared to Yo uh, YOLO, and we're working on this right now, is we're doing binary classification, bus, no bus. We're not doing bounding boxes. So um, one of the summer uh, interns of summer it has extended no scope to do the bounding boxes, but you don't get the same speed up. You still get a, I don't want to quote numbers, but it's still going to be more than like a 2x speed up for this, yeah. OK. So, mean? so if you really, if we want total recall, are you still gonna gonna get that kind of uh, good speed up? Yeah, if you want total recall, um, you won't. You'll definitely get some speed up. Well, okay, it depends, right? So there's some cases like some of these sort of filtering uh, steps you can totally do, like. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about is we, do, we train a, a temporal you know, difference detector. It says, did this frame change? So what this looks like is basically I diff my frame compared to the last thing I ran YOLO on, and I basically uh, you know, run an LR over the differences, a logistic regression over the differences, and it says, this thing, yeah, something likely changed. So if I'm running at 30 frames per second, you know, it's highly uh, likely that the label change rate is much lower than the frame change rate. So you know, that's a way to get a, you know, 10 plus X speed up, basically for free. For the specialization task, I believe it is possible to actually get um, substantial speed ups. I don't want to say you know three orders of magnitude, but um, you know we've been we've been benchmarking things like um, if I just train um, ResNets on say cat versus dog versus cat versus insect and various forms of sort of um, restricted input classes and restricted output classes, you can still get a five to 10 X uh, performance increase, right? Um, now, note that this is not going to be a recall on the entire set of the you know, uh, images, but basically specializing for a fixed set of classes, our preliminary results suggest you can get you know, much more than you can get from doing like training with quantization and training with pruning, right? So, so and this is just because essentially, what, what, well, yeah, I don't know, we can take it offline, but, but I think the cool idea here is that if you restrict the, you can think of like you know the, the manifold of things that you're looking for. You can train a much simpler classifier to distinguish between these um, if you restrict the, the the test data. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.